This channel is part of the History Hits Network. We've all seen the pictures and read the stories in the history books about the kings and queens with their power and privilege and silks and furs. But in this series, I want to discover the other side of history. I'm already quite nervous. The side we don't often hear about. How ordinary British people lived their lives. From the Tudors, you'll see why it did attract my attention. <laughs> Disgusting. To the Victorians. Throw a stone in Victorian London, you will hit a drunken cabman. There's, there's, there's that many of them. We are not amused. From the Georgians. You take the saw. Oh, my God. It's you horrible don't... just seeing you do that. Oh. To the people who really fought the Second World War. James could hear the ping of bullets and the clatter of shrapnel. One thing's for sure, these people knew the meaning of the word tough. I'll be finding the truth about their daily lives. What they ate, how long would that have lasted? Up to three years. How they made a living. There's even value in a rat when it's dead. And those vital necessities of life. What did you do if you wanted to pee? Guy in the bucket. The bucket? This is British history from the bottom up. You've got to admit, I am terrifying. <laughs> this time, I'm heading back to the Victorian age, when Britain ruled the world. And mutton chops weren't just something you ate, they were also lovely whiskers. Why, thank you. Now, while you might be thinking that Victorian Britain was made by a bunch of mustachioed men like him, the truth was very different. Because the unsung heroes who really put the great into Great Britain were just the ordinary folk who had to cope with the most dramatic changes the world has ever seen. While Queen Victoria was busy gazing down from her throne, her loyal subjects were hard at work in factories up and down the land, churning out everything from steam engines to natty clothes and cutlery. But life on the factory floor was cheap. A combination of lethal machinery and long hours meant that gruesome accidents, even death, were never very far away. And right up there in the list of most lethal jobs in Victorian Britain was the match girl. Like Sarah Chapman here, still called a girl when this picture was taken when she was almost 30. In the late 1800s, if you went down the Mile End Road, turned left at a pub called The Swan and down a little alleyway, you'd come to Sarah Chapman's house. She lived in a court just like this one, in a house with her father Samuel, her mother Sarah Ann and her six brothers and sisters. One of seven kids, Sarah was a feisty young un with a sharp brain. We know that at school she learned how to read and write. But this, remember, was Victorian Britain, where at the age of 13, working-class kids like Sarah had to put aside such fripperies as education and get themselves a job. And for Sarah, that meant starting work in the same factory as her mum and sister. This is where Sarah worked, the Bryant and May Match Factory. Back in those days, it would have been frenetic around here, with over a 1,000 women and girls working here six days a week, every week. You see, there was nothing the Victorians loved more than setting fire to things. Lamps, logs, more lamps, and, of course, tobacco, which meant that the humble match was an invaluable item. This is an old Bryant and May matchbox. And the thing about this match was that it would strike anywhere, as you can see. Yeah, very effective. So effective that by 1860, Bryant and May were churning out 75,000 boxes of the things every day. To keep up with demand, match girls like Sarah were expected to work 14-hour shifts 
virtually all of it on their feet. Can you imagine? Luckily, she was promoted, and by 19, Sarah was working as a machinist, the person who cut the matchsticks down to size. If Sarah ever got sick, that was just tough luck. The factory was perfectly entitled to discard her like a, well, like a spent match. <laughs> For all that, she earned a meagre wage of five shillings a week, which is about 16 pounds a week in today's money. But even that could be severely reduced by harsh fines on things like sitting down, being untidy, dropping a match, or even just going to the toilet without permission. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans, with exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. Whether you're looking to dive into life and crime in Victorian London, or the forgotten history that deserves to be heard, History Hit has a documentary for you, just a click away. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you can't find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Nor was there much let up when Sarah finally got home. Sam Johnson is Sarah's great great granddaughter, and she's here to tell me a bit more about her home life. There were seven children in the family. Which is why there's so many beds here. Exactly, yes, yes, and they would have all been cramped into, into a tiny room like this. So maybe that's what created her feisty personality. I bet she was the boss in the bedroom when she was a kid. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Chuck the boys on the floor and uh, get a good get sleep. Bed, yeah. <laughs> As for her one day off, well, after a quick breakfast of bread and dripping, it would be out with the broom and on with the housework. <laughs> the girls, as soon as they were old enough, would have pulled their weight with the housework. So they would do all the washing of the clothes and the cleaning the house and getting the baking done ready for the week. Only then would Sarah finally have been able to put her feet up with a nice cup of tea and perhaps a puff on a pipe. The next morning... <laughs> and it would be up with the lark for the start of another shift at the factory. But Sarah's life wasn't just exhausting. It was also blooming dangerous. <laughs> you see, unlike today's safety matches, matchsticks back then were dipped in a chemical called white phosphorus. It was this that made the matches catch fire. But phosphorus comes with some horrible side effects. And there was one that Sarah dreaded above all others. Girls who'd worked here for some time could get a condition which they called fuzzy jaw. It was a terrible disease that caused the bones around the mouth to slowly rot away and emit a foul-smelling pus. As the infection spread, it would lead to horrendous disfigurement, organ failure and eventually death. Luckily, Sarah escaped this grisly fate, but many of her co-workers, around one in ten of them, didn't. Not that the factory owners seemed to care. <laughs> Even Sarah's lunch hour was full of danger. The women and girls were forced to eat their lunch on the factory floor where phosphorus particles could easily get into their food. There was no other space available and they weren't allowed to eat outside. Health and safety. <laughs> so bad were conditions in the Bryant and May factory that on the 6th of July 1888, Sarah and her fellow workers downed matchsticks and went on strike. By the end of July, Bryant and May had caved in. The whole thing had been a complete PR disaster for them, and they agreed all the women's demands. You can imagine Sarah and her friends racing out of here absolutely over the moon. On the back of the hard graft of ordinary Victorians, the UK became the richest and most powerful nation on Earth. With all that money rolling in, the Victorians did what great empires have always done. They built things. 
huge engineering projects like railways, bridges and tunnels, many of them still in use today. Building these monster projects was the job of the navvies, big strapping blokes like Angus Innes from Glasgow. Now, we don't exactly know what Angus looked like, but we can take a guess, because Scottish navvies like nothing more than dressing up in their spare time, just like teddy boys, mods and Peaky Blinders, to let people know who they were. They sported moleskin jackets, scarlet waistcoats and bright blue caps. This is the kind of place where Angus would have lived. He would have rented a room or part of a room or even part of a bed in a boarding house. It would all have been pretty grim. Most of Angus's time, though, was spent building things, like Glasgow's new sewage system. You see, Victorian Glasgow was dirtier than a badger's bottom. Its slums were so bad, they were almost as disgusting as London's. Coming home at night from the pub, Angus would have constantly had to watch his step for fear of treading in something unmentionable. In this kind of environment, disease was rife. A system of tunnels was needed to get all the sewage out of the city. And it was navvies like Angus who were called on to do the work. After a typical navvies breakfast of six slices of bacon, a loaf of bread, one can of condensed milk and two pints of beer, Angus's 12-hour shift would begin the moment his foreman gave the order. His job was to dig the huge trenches that held the new sewage pipes. Using muscle power alone, Angus was expected to shift a hernia-inducing 20 tonnes of earth a day. Oh. The more muck he moved, the more he was paid. Oh. On average, that was about 25 pence a day, the equivalent of about eight quid. But most of that he would have spent on beer. A mind-boggling gallon a day of the stuff. Oh, cheers. This massive sewage pipe is an impressive example of the kind of work that navvies were doing here in Glasgow in the 19th century. But to get a more vivid picture of Angus's life, I'm going to travel 30 miles north of here into the Highlands. From census records, we know that by the late 1850s, Angus had upped sticks and moved here to the bonny banks of Loch Katrine where he was helping to build a tunnel to carry clean drinking water into Glasgow. This is the water tunnel, which ran for 30 miles straight into the centre of Glasgow. The census also tells us that Angus was now married and that his wife Helen and their young family were living here too, no doubt enjoying the peaceful countryside along with hundreds of other navvies and a bunch of angry locals. Midges. By now, Angus was moving up in the world and had swapped his shovel for a much more important job. Using explosives to blast a tunnel through the mountains. Which was, of course, very, very dangerous. In fact, the accident and death rate for navvies was higher than for any other group of workers in the country, and that included coal miners and soldiers. No wonder Angus liked a tipple. At the end of the day, exhausted from blowing up the Scottish countryside, Angus would have rejoined Helen and the kids at the temporary camp beside the loch. Here to tell me more about life inside the camp is local historian Sean Barrington. It was a well-organised community. There'd be the cooking squad, so there'd be no problem getting beef and lamb and pigs and oatmeal porridge. There'd be porridge morning, noon and night. That's astonishing. I, I would have assumed that a navvy working here would have been three-quarters starved and having the most miserable time possible. But actually what you're describing is something... Worth... Yeah, it's rigorous, Yes. but uh, at least your belly's full. Were the women able to work? 
Oh, the women would be fully, fully employed. There would be laundry that would need to be done. So, lots of meat by day, booze by night, and clean pants. And absolutely. <laughs> After four years of muck, sweat, and beer, Angus's time at Loch Katrine finally came to an end. And in 1859, the new water channel he'd helped to build was opened by none other than Queen Victoria. I name this pipeline the Katrine Aqueduct. Navvies like Angus were a special breed. They were itinerant, rootless, often very isolated. It was like you had the working class there and somewhere down here were the navvies at the very bottom of the pecking order. And yet it was people like Angus and his like who built modern Britain with their bare hands and their legacy is still with us today. The Industrial Revolution really took off under the Victorians. But none of their fancy steam engines, cotton mills or water pumps would have been any use without coal. Coal powered the Victorian age and the mining industry was huge. In 1841, nearly 220,000 people worked in the mines. Most of them were men, but around about 5,000 of them were either women or children as young as five. Among these women was one Betty Harris. We don't have any actual photos of her, but she might have looked a bit like this young lass, holding what seems to be a giant tambourine. Betty and her husband lived in a small rented cottage not far from Knowles Pit in Bolton. A place much like this. It was all very cosy. Fire was going all the time, of course. Well, fuel was everywhere, wasn't it? And here's a clue. Tiny little seat, tiny little potty. They had two children, and when they were at work, Betty's cousin looked after them. In order to keep Betty's household going, her cousin did all the housework. She cleaned the house, she went shopping every day, because fridges hadn't been invented yet. She cleaned the courtyard, she did all the washing. Imagine how difficult it would have been keeping things clean with all that smoke and dust about. I don't envy her. But if running a Victorian household wasn't exactly a barrel of laughs, Working down the mine was just horrendous. Six days a week, dressed in trousers and jacket, our Betty would leave the house at dawn and head down pit, where she could spend the next 14 hours on her hands and knees like a beast of burden hauling coal. It's hard to imagine anything more grim. To learn more about Betty's life underground, I've come to Cap House Colliery near Wakefield. If you'd like to follow me, please, through all these doors. Yep. I've been joined by Denise Bates, whose great-great-great-great-grandmother was a Victorian mining lass like Betty. Can you imagine just schlepping up and down here every single day? I think we sometimes don't realise we're born. <laughs> no, we don't do it. Just like Betty, we're going to have to crawl on our hands and knees to get to the coal face. Whoa! Oh, God, it <laughs> really hurts your hands. Like most of the women and children who worked in the mines, Betty's job was to drag the big, heavy carts used to carry the coal. So this is the conditions that Betty would have been working in, right? Oh, definitely. She reported that she was working in a very nasty pit. Oh! Oh, I can't imagine what it must have been like if these were your working conditions for how many hours a day, do you reckon? 14 hours, depending on demand. Blimey. And would you get up to the surface at lunchtime? Not a chance. <laughs> More likely to have been a hunk of bread and cheese on the go. Is this the cold face here? Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, God, yeah. I should have touched that. <laughs> So, uh, tell me about Betty. 
She was working for her husband, which was the practice of females who mined in Lancashire. What do you think their relationship would have been like? Betty mentions that there's an awful lot of domestic violence going on, that there were very many women who were being beaten by the man that they worked for, for no other reason than their inability to move those trucks as fast as the men wanted. What with the heat, the dust and the regular beatings, life for Betty was about as tough as it gets. When Betty got home from work, usually around 6.30 or 7 in the evening, she would have been absolutely exhausted. She'd have been filthy, sweating, but she would have been far too tired to have a wash before she went to bed. One thing she'd definitely have done, though, is have a decent meal. She'd have needed the calories. Apart from rent, virtually all her money went on food. Victorian delicacies such as tripe, trotters, or budget lamb cuts from sheep that had dropped down dead from disease. Come Sunday, her one and only day off, Betty was then expected to catch up on chores like darning socks and knitting stockings, while hubby put his feet up and contemplated the serious issues of the world. But Betty's life was about to change. In 1838, a flood at a Yorkshire colliery drowned 26 children, prompting a report after a lengthy public inquiry. So the report was published, and as you can imagine, the press were all over it. Here's some of the daily newspapers that came out in May 1842. Some great pictures here. Look, you've got propelling the loaded wagons, digging out the coal. Imagine seeing these for the first time if you didn't know that that kind of thing went on in your country. But the revelations didn't end there. In fact, it wasn't the long hours, the dust, the awful conditions, the industrial accidents that shocked people. It was, believe it or not, the nudity. The girls, they are naked down to the waist. Young females dressed like boys in trousers crawling on all fours. Any sight more disgustingly indecent or revolting can scarcely be imagined than these girls at work. No brothel can beat it. Disgusting. In actual fact, if it hadn't at all, such topless working was extremely rare. But still, the report had a dramatic effect. And in 1842, the Mines and Collieries Act put a stop to women, including our Betty, working underground. In Victorian Britain, the place to be was in the city. London might have been filthy and plagued by crime, but by the 1850s, it was the world's largest city. And in just 40 years, its population doubled in size, just like Queen Victoria's waistline. We are not amused. And all those new people meant lots of work for London's cabbies. Keb, sir. Keb. Men like John Cochrane. John was born in 1833 and lived in Hoban, an old-fashioned part of London full of narrow alleyways and densely packed housing but he was looking to move up in the world. The year is 1851, and 18-year-old John Cockrum wants to set up in business. He wants to do exactly what his dad did before him and be the driver of a horse and cab. Hello, Daniel. You are looking so beautiful, aren't you? <laughs> but sadly, his dad isn't around anymore to show him the ropes. Because when John was 11, his old man had passed away. Leaving behind a wife, four kids and a huge pile of debt. To make ends meet, the young John had been forced to become the main breadwinner. And by 18, he scrimped and saved enough money to buy himself a horse, hire a cab and follow in his dearly departed dad's footsteps. <sighs> 
But the problem for John was that he looked really young. And on one of his first journeys, he was accused of being a buck, which was the slang word for an unlicensed driver. But he wasn't. He was perfectly legal. He was over 16, and he knew the highways and byways of London, which were the two stipulations. Right, let's go. Come on. <laughs> Back in the 1850s, London streets would have been filled with horse-drawn cabs just like this, leaving great piles of steaming dung in their wake. But while the middle-class passengers were able to put their feet up and enjoy the view, for working-class lads like young John, the job was relentless, six days a week. On an average day, he'd start touting for work about 9am and finish at midnight. He didn't have a little yellow for hire sire on the top of the cab. If he wanted to show people that he was available, he held up his whip like this. Where to, love? Sitting on top of his cab, with only a hat and a couple of old coats for protection, John was exposed to the very worst of London's weather. Chucking all that Victorian soot and smog and the lifestyle of cabbies like John was about as healthy as smoking 40 a day. <laughs> the money wasn't much better either. To make a profit, he had to work really hard. You only got sixpence a mile for a cab like this, and out of that, you had to pay yard money for the stabling and feeding of the horse. It's a tough old job. And it was about to get a whole lot tougher. You see, horses can be very temperamental. As poor old John discovered one afternoon, shortly after buying his very own cab, when his horse suddenly bolted, causing his new set of wheels to flip over, leaving John with a hefty repair bill. Mm. In fact, accidents like this were pretty common, and more often than not, they were caused by the same thing. Cab drivers were notorious for spending hour after hour in the pub. But did they really? I'll ask a cabbie. Taxi driver Sean Farrell writes a blog on the history of London's cabbies. So, by law, they should have been sitting on the box of the cab, no matter what the weather. Yeah. In truth, they hid inside a pub. Presumably, there must have been examples of cab drivers coming out of the pub hammered and having accidents. Oh, they're, they're numerous. It, <laughs> throw a stone in Victorian London, you will hit a drunken cabman. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's that, there's that many of them. But not John Cockrum. Because John, one of the few cabbies who refused to work on a Sunday, didn't approve of the demon drink. So while his fellow cabbies were off getting plastered, John could be found sitting on the taxi rank, reading a book, and munching on a popular Victorian dish, sorted herring. And before long, he'd signed up to an extraordinary new idea. A scheme to stop cabbies from drinking and driving. I know, mad. I'm not really allowed in here, am I? I'm not a cabbie. You're not, but I'll let you, I might give you my badge. <laughs> in 1875, John attended the opening of London's very first cab shelter a place where cabbies could wait for customers without drinking their body weight in beer. It's great in here, isn't it? Lovely. It's nice and compact and bijou. Yeah. It's a funny shape, though, isn't it? It's really long and thin. They're designed to be the same width and length as the original horse and cow coach, so they didn't take up no more extra space in the road. Oh, so, so just go cab, 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 little hut, cab, cab. Exactly. Do you think it would have been very similar in Victorian times? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you've got electric lighting there. It would have been gas lighting in them days. But they've got, they got a gas stove. They would cook, provide hot meals for you, hot tea, coffee. You could even bring a steak, to, and they would cook it for you and charge you accordingly. And while he was getting his protein hit, John could also browse through a selection of complimentary books and newspapers, keeping his brain fit and alert to deal with London's roads and grow his business. By the time the cab shelters were built in the 1870s, John's business was thriving. He ended up, cheers love, with nearly 30 people working for him and 126 horses. In fact, when he was 68, he sold up and retired on the profits. Not bad for a cabbie, eh? 
Cheers, mate. Cheers. Victorian Britain was brimming with inventions and people experimenting with new ideas. But forget your isambard kingdom Brunels of this world and all those boats and bridges of his and consider instead another great Victorian advance. It's the invention of modern shopping. You see, with all that new industry, wages were on the up. And for the first time, working people had a bit of money to spend. The canny Victorian shopkeeper was only too pleased to help. By the late 19th century, the competition for customers was really hotting up. A hundred years previously, a window display like this one would have been completely unimaginable. The shops had been small, specialist and staffed by very fierce shopkeepers. But change was on its way and it was pioneered by women like Esther Brown. Here she is. Esther was born in 1878 in Manchester where she grew up in a small terraced house. Her dad, Joseph, worked on the trams, while her mum, Margaret, stayed at home looking after Esther and her brother and sister. The Victorians, though, didn't really do childhood. And by the age of 14, Esther had left school and was working on a market stall selling household bits and bobs. But down the market, things were a bit, well, down market. And when Esther was offered a job in a fancy new shop, she jumped at the chance. Esther came up this very road on the first day of her first proper job. The year was 1894 and she was 16. This is Cheetham Hill. It's not the most salubrious part of Manchester, is it? There would have been trams clanging backwards and forwards, lots of new immigrant communities. It would have been noisy, vibrant, energetic, and it was Esther's big day. Her new job was as a shop girl at Michael Marx's Penny Bazaar, which was the very first Marx and Spencer's store. This is the Cheatham Hill M&S now. Well, it was absolutely nothing like that. This was virtually a Victorian pound shop. He kept the stock under tarpaulin in the backyard and over the front door, there was a big scarlet sign that said, don't ask the price, it's a penny. Marx's Penny Bazaar wasn't just a bargain hunter's paradise, though. Oh, that is so lovely. You see, for years, if a customer so much as stepped into a shop, they were expected to buy something. But all that was about to change, with a little help from Esther. Esther's job was to try to persuade her customers to do something entirely new. In fact, it was so new, they had to invent a word for it, and that word was browsing, looking at the goods without feeling that you had a compunction to buy them. Nowadays, we're all brilliant at browsing, aren't we? But back then, it was a novelty. Oh, look, a rolling pin, I can handle it. A basket, I can touch it. Of course, the downside was that from now on, shoplifting became a big problem. I'm sorry, it must have just fallen in my bag. Once the customer had chosen what they wanted, a wooden spoon, maybe, a chopping board, four candles, that's actually what these are, then Esther would wrap them all up, but she wasn't allowed to tot up the money. That had to be done by a man. Leanne, can you demonstrate how this procedure works? Certainly. Five pennies. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I would then put this in here. This half a ball, this will be closed tight. Now I would put this in the, the slot, send it up through the system. To the cash office? That would go to the cash office. The gentleman would record in the ledger what you'd spent and he would send you change back the exact same way. A nice, sensible man who would know how to add up. Of course. Not like the giddy girls who wouldn't be trusted with that. <laughs> While adding up wasn't high on her list of duties, Esther was expected to be smart, polite, and have the constitution of a... <laughs> exactly. 
Anyone who's ever worked in retail knows what it's like standing on your feet all day. But Esther's day started at six in the morning, finished 10 or 11 at night. So a 90 hour week in big clumpy shoes, heavy skirt, stiff back, smiling nicely all the time. Must have been so exhausting. <laughs> And of course, her customers paid her wages, so they were always, always right. At lunchtime, Esther didn't get much of a break, but Michael Marks was better than most employers. At least he installed gas rings like these in the back office, so the girls could get some hot food. Such as that shop girl's favourite, a nice bowl of green pea soup. Lovely. For her efforts, Esther was paid a modest £25 a year, around half of what a male shop assistant earned, but just enough for the odd trip to the music hall on her one day off. Working in the shop is so commonplace nowadays that it's easy to underestimate quite how different it would have been for someone like Esther. In those days, a lot of people thought that shop girls were a bit tainted, like prostitutes, you know, just standing out there in public selling stuff to customers. Happily, though, for Esther, things were beginning to look up. Because as shopping got more and more popular, shops began to move into fancy arcades like this. And as for the women who were working in them, they started to have a career path. They could end up as shop managers. And who was one of the first women to do just that? Esther Brown. Before the Victorian age, travel was a bit of a bore. The fastest thing around had four legs and eight straw. So no wonder the invention of the steam train got everyone, including Queen Victoria, rather excited. Albert, I want one. But trains weren't just for the rich and famous. They were used by almost everyone. Like this ordinary shoemaker's son from Manchester, who describes one memorable train journey in his diary. It is very strange reading the diary of someone who was born over 200 years ago and is so candid about their life. His name was Edwin Waugh. He was a secretary writing letters in his office in Manchester in the late 1840s. he just turned 30. He lived in Hume with his wife, who looked after the house when he was away working, which is what a Victorian wife would have done in those days. Everything seems hunky-dory, but the diary tells a very different story. Because Edwin was utterly miserable. He and his wife, Mary Ann, weren't exactly love's young dream. Went to Rochdale in the evening in company with my wife. Oh, full of unhappy reflections. Oh. And then there was work. Edwin loathed his job and he hated being two-faced, trying to squeeze money out of people who were in debt to his company. He wrote in his diary, I don't have the beggarly eloquence which can humbug them into a false generosity. For his efforts, Edwin earned about a pound a week, around 130 quid in today's money. But often he wasn't paid at all, prompting him to complain, my wife and me had just one halfpenny between us and we knew not where the next meal was to come from. For the long-suffering Mrs War, it all got too much. After a particularly heated row with his wife, Mary Ann, Edwin describes her packing her bags and heading off for her aunt Sally's in Rochdale. She even takes the rocking chair with her, so she's clearly not intending to come home. Edwin's response is to turn to drink. But Mary Ann must have had second thoughts because she eventually returned home, presumably with the rocking chair too. To celebrate their reunion, Edwin splashed out on a pair of railway tickets to that home of holiday fun, 
Blackpool. Mary Ann was going to be so pleased. On the morning of the Blackpool excursion, Edwin gets up early, tries to wake his wife, but she won't budge. He's not going to let her spoil his day, though. So he gets washed, gets all ready, and leaves the house. Oh, Mary Ann. When he got to the station, Edwin was gobsmacked by what he saw. I found an astounding gathering of people, upwards of 2,000 persons. You see, to the average Victorian city dweller, the lure of the sea was like human catnip. And beginning in the 1840s, special railway excursions began ferrying hordes of overexcited day trippers to such far flung locations as Brighton, Bangor, and in Edwin's case, Blackpool. Susan, <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> Thank Good you. Good to see you. We're going off on a yes, holiday. It's very exciting. To tell me more about Edwin's big day out is railway historian Susan Major. Why was he so excited about this excursion? Well, he had a particular thing about the thrill of being in a crowd. Now, to us, being in a crowd is a nuisance. Yeah, but, yeah. But somebody like him, he felt it made it feel as if it was one world. It was a new thing. It was a modern thing. Oh, definitely. In Edwin's diary, he does say that there were 2,000 people. I thought that was a misprint. No, the, these were monster trains with monster excursions quite often. You'd find more than one engine pulling up to 100 carriages. Uh, it, there could be three, four engines. It would have been like being on the London Tube in the rush hour in June, <laughs> wouldn't it? People must have felt as though they were being treated as animals. They felt as if they were being dehumanised, so they would bleat and moo and bar. Finally, Edwin's train pulled into Blackpool, where he and his fellow passengers disembarked, and like a crowd of starving penguins, headed straight for the sea. So Edwin comes down the high street from the station, and remember, because the crowd know that they've only got a limited amount of time here, they immediately set to work having a good time. The Blackpool of 1849 didn't yet have its famous tower, or even a pier for that matter. Nonetheless, Edwin was totally smitten. The thing he likes more than anything else, though, is the donkeys. There's little kids who get on them and they won't move. He says everybody is having a good time, except presumably the donkeys. And then towards the end of his stay, he buys four chops, raw chops, off some bloke. And then he goes back into town where someone in a shop fries them up for him for fourpence. What a way to spend the day. As for his problems, well, they now seemed a million miles away. But things weren't just looking up for Edwin. In a momentous time marked by new railways, new sewage systems, and even modern shopping, Go. the Victorian period was a crucial part of British history, driven by ordinary women and men across the land. The Nazis were the most terrifying enemies in one of the nastiest wars in history. But taking them on wasn't just down to men like him. Britain fought the Second World War with a bunch of ordinary office workers, grocers, bakers and housewives. Aye. We know the result, but what was it really like for ordinary Britons caught up in it all? Most of the people who still remember the Second World War were only children at the time, but 
Even though they were just kids, a lot of them still have vivid memories of having to seek shelter because their country was under brutal attack. In 1940, eight-year-old Babs Clark and her family found themselves in the thick of it all in London's East End. So what did Babs's mum do? She grabbed the kids and headed for the countryside. Thousands of parents had the same idea. Nearly a million school children were packed off to the country. Babs and her mum and sister Jean ended up in Torquay. It was amazing. They had a small cottage on a farm and went to a local school. Best of all, they could play on the beach every day, safe from the bombs. Or so they thought. Babs, now in her 80s, still remembers one particular incident like it was yesterday. There was a couple of planes coming in from the sea. And I was saying to my sister, I wonder what they are, Jean. And it was two Messerschmitts and they machine gun the beach we were on. Cos we came home full of it, telling my mum, and I won't say the actual words my mum said, but in other words, it was so-and-so that for a game of soldiers, we're going back to London, I'd rather have the bombs coming down than the bloody Germans machine gunning my kids. <laughs> Babs and her mum and sister hot-footed it back to the family home in Bethnal Green. Which was yours? This one. So um, when you got back to London, what was your house like? It was all right, apart from the fact we had to have a tarpaulin over the roof. Because the roof had got blown off during the Blitz. And you still live there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course you did. The family's unscheduled break in Torquay may well have saved their lives. And after Hitler had had his way with the East End, it was even more fun than the beach. If, well, a little dangerous. More of a problem for growing kids was food. The government was keen to make sure nothing got wasted. To make sure Britain didn't run out, the amount of food everybody could eat was rationed. And every time you wanted to buy something, you got a stamp in this, your ration book. For Bab's mum, it was a right old drag. Stuff this for a game of soldiers. And provided for only a limited menu. This is what Babs would have been allowed in her rations. A couple of pints of milk, some sugar, a little bit of cheese, some jam, some marge, some lard, one egg and some egg powder, this much meat and a few sweets. It would make a lovely meal, wouldn't it? But it had to last Babs a whole week. The government was full of useful advice on how to make everything go further. But there was one thing that wasn't in short supply for Babs and her family, greens. We hate spinach. We had our allotment and we grew a lot of veg and our allotment was in there. My dad used to be quite proud of that allotment, what things he grew. <laughs> yeah. What did your mum make you? Stew. We used to have a lot of stews. After tea, as night fell, Babs and her mum and sister would head down to the newly built Bethnal Green tube station. East Enders depended on the underground as the best place to hide from Hitler's bombs. My mum got a bunk down here for a us. A bunk? Yeah, it was a three-tier bunk, bottom, middle and top. There was loads of space because the rails hadn't yet been laid in the new station. But it's surprising the bunks didn't collapse. They'd been assembled by Boy Scouts from a flat pack. How far down that tunnel did you used to sleep? 
I wouldn't like to say how many yards, but it was a good 10, 15 minute walk. It was quite a way down. And you didn't feel claustrophobic? No, no. I mean, you had the bunks either side and the walkway in the middle, and I think it's because we knew so many people. My mum had stopped and talked to them, and you got to your bunk in the end. What did you do if you wanted to pee? Go in the bucket. The bucket? Yeah, they had buckets. Very so far along. Yeah. With the curtain round it. Very smelly. Oh. Apart from the smell, it all sounds rather jolly. It was like an underground town with a library, doctor's surgery, say ah, oh. and a hall for weddings or parties. Every time a soldier came home, they had a jolly shindig. Did you feel safe here? Yeah. But there again, you see, I had my mum and my sisters, so I felt safe cos I was with them. I wonder if you left anything down there. It's chewing gum. <laughs> I stuck so. it on one of the walls. Could still be there, couldn't it? I reckon it? it still is there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the fun was about to come to a juddering halt, as once again, the realities of war hit home. On the 3rd of March 1943, an incident took place at Bethnal Green, which in moments became a major tragedy. It was a rainy night, the air raid siren went off at 8.17. People started coming down into the tube as they always did. But at that moment, anti-aircraft guns began to start firing in Victoria Park, just over the road there. So more and more people came down. And it was very dark, they only got one light because of the blackout. And there weren't handrails here then like there are now. And all the steps were really slippy. And a woman tripped over with her son and some old chap fell on top of them. And more and more people kept pressing down until they were right up to the ceiling, crushing each other. Although Bab survived, many didn't. A memorial next to Bethnal Green tube station, erected surprisingly recently in 2017, marks the worst British civilian disaster in World War II. 173 people were crushed to death. What do you remember about that night? I know I got pushed and I fell over something and somebody fell on me. There were so many people down the stairs, they were all falling on top of them. And I just heard my sister saying, oh, don't pull me out yet, I've got my little sister here. And with that, whoever it was pulled the pair of us out. Didn't know what had happened to my mum. And my sister was going round asking if people had seen anything of her mum, which they hadn't. And then an air raid warden said to her, go in that room, she might be in there. Jean went in there and um, it was all dead bodies she had to look at to see if her mum was there. Luckily, Bab's mum had survived. And the next day, life went on as usual. She still got us up the next morning for me to go to school. And the headmaster was in assembly and he said, there's been a bad accident at Bethlehem Green Tube Station. And he said, any of you children that were in it, you can go home for the day. <laughs> well, after the school come home yeah. with us, they all marched down. Did you ever use that shelter again, or was it closed down? Oh, no, we used it as following night. Babs and her family just kept calm and carried on. The German bombing campaign deliberately set out to undermine our morale. But talking to Babs, I get a real sense of the conviction and determination that was shared by almost everyone. And I reckon it was that, as much as anything, that got us through. Many, though, faced a different kind of danger. Hundreds of thousands of ordinary young men were learning how to fight and to kill. James Palmer was one of them. James Palmer lived in Hume, Manchester with his dad. He was very larky, very jokey as a lad. Oh, by heck, do you think they're impressed? I should flip him well up, Sil. 
Very good. What's next? By 1939, he was working as an office boy in the garage. He spent a lot of time with his girlfriend, Muriel, and he was just about to turn 21. James's birthday was on July the 1st, but it was a slightly glum affair. War was on the horizon, and young men between the ages of 20 and 22 were being recruited by the government to boost army numbers. James must have opened his birthday cards with mixed feelings. Especially as one of the cards wasn't a card at all. It was his call-up notice. Within two weeks, James was being seen off at the station by his girlfriend and his dad. James's parting from his father was emotional for both men. His dad had served in the First War and had seen the horrors of the battlefield firsthand. And when his wife had died, he devoted himself to looking after his son. And now, he was going to have to let him go. He must have been worried sick. He knew all about war. James wrote in his diary on the day he left. Muriel was in tears, clinging to my arm. Dad turned away as she kissed me. A lump in my throat prevented me from saying much. I was on my way to God knows where or what. Where James was actually headed was Warminster to join the 13th Tank Regiment. On his first day, James was presented with loads of stuff. I'm meeting Alex Jones, a war veteran and army historian, to find out more. So he would suddenly have been responsible for all this? Absolutely. As soon as they arrived, they'd have been given a kit bag in the QM stores. And of course, if the army gives someone kit and equipment, you know there's going to be inspections coming up. He'd have had to have bulled his boots. He'd have had to have pressed his kit. He would have had to have uh, blankoed the webbing as well. So given it this kind of nice green protective layer, which all the soldiers thought was utterly pointless. Don't say a word, absolute silence. So this is what his setup would have been like. He's not real, by the way, just in case you were wondering. He'd have had a cupboard like this with all his stuff in it and his uniforms laid out, and he'd have had a regulation blanket, everything ship-shape, all out there for the world to see. But amidst all this Boise jollity, James met the corporal in charge. Jock, a regular soldier. On the first night, the lights go out, Darkness, you're supposed to go to sleep. But some of the recruits keep on talking and Jock tells them to shut up, but they don't. In fact, they're talking even louder. And Jock goes, when I tell you to do something, you do it. And it goes completely silent. And then one of the recruits says, get stuffed. And then all hell breaks loose. Jock grabs him and punches him straight in the face and knocks him out cold. Oh. Welcome to the war, James. But it wasn't only this mouthy private who got a rude shock from army life. James and the new soldiers like him were complete fishes out of water, weren't they? They really were, because they didn't have any prior military training. Maybe the only experience they had were the stories maybe from their fathers. We know James's father was a veteran of the Somme, for example. Yeah. What would his training have been? Well, James, when he first turned up, would have undertaken eight weeks of basic military training. <laughs> it also would have consisted of anti-gas training. Uh, the army was very concerned about the gas threat. Behind you, there is a pretty fearsome-looking instrument. Presumably, he would have been trained on that. Yes, this is the, the Vickers machine gun, which would have been the standard armament in a lot of British light tanks at the start of the war. James recounts when he first gets his chance to, to shoot on a live range. Yeah. Uh, he's so excited, he just fires off all the rounds at once. He's going blam, 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 forever and ever. Well, no, because all he has, given the cuts uh, to training allowances, yeah. is 20 rounds to practise with which at about 500 rounds a minute, meant that James would be out of ammo in... Ooh, about two seconds. Oh. Perhaps because of his enthusiasm, James was assigned to be a gunner on a tank.
Then, in late May 1940, the call finally came. James was going to fight in France. He was given 48 hours leave, and then he was off. He spent his last day in Britain with his girlfriend Muriel and his father before heading across the Channel. When he landed, the German army was only a few miles away, and his tank troop soon found itself under attack. As we topped the rise, anti-tank guns hit us from the right flank. Four of our tanks were ablaze before we'd gone 10 yards. We were sitting ducks. It was sheer murder. I saw some men running amongst the trees with their clothes burning like torches. Men were dragging their pals through the mud away from the burning tanks. And the smell of burning flesh was catching my throat. James crouched and he could hear the ping of bullets and the clatter of shrapnel but his tank driver pressed on and on through the hailstorm of fire, and eventually he reached the other side of the valley. Their first action had been a disaster, though. Only four of the 25 lads in James's troop were still alive. Soon, his regiment was desperately retracing the path back to the coast as the army retreated via Dunkirk. They were off back to Blighty almost as soon as they'd left. James returned to Manchester and proposed to Muriel. She said yes, but now James had a war to win. He'd be in some of its most crucial battles before life would return to anything like normal and he and his new fiance could finally tie the knot. For many ordinary Brits, taking on Hitler's fearsome war machine demanded a brazen response. And women especially suddenly found themselves doing all sorts of things they'd never imagined doing. Women like Eileen Heron. In 1939, Eileen was 23 but she still lived at home because she worked for her family's grocery business in Folkestone, where she served behind the counter and drove the delivery van. Eileen was a bit of a pioneer. When she was only 20, she'd been among the first women to take the newly introduced driving test. Little did she know, though, what use her driving skills would be once the war started. Just three months into it, 43,000 women volunteered for the Auxiliary Territorial Service, or ATS, the Women's Infantry. And Eileen decided to do her bit and join them. The army welcomed her with an armful of jabs, just a scratch, ah! from a needle already blunted by the other recruits. She shared a freezing Nissen hut with around 20 other women, but at least they could help each other take their medicine before settling down on a lumpy mattress. Oh, night-night. I wonder if Eileen regretted her decision as she sat in her freezing cold barracks. There was three feet of snow on the ground, and OK, the recruits were given a bucket of coal a day, but one bucket was hardly going to make any impact at all in a tin building. At the end of the first week, she trudged all the way to the nearest town, for a hot bath at the swimming pool and a nice cup of cocoa. But getting used to unsumptuous living conditions was the easy bit. Eileen was in the army now, and there was a whole new world of pain to embrace. For the new recruits, training was intense and relentless. From the shrill sound of the bugle at 6am, the whole day was a long list of drills, physical exercises and skills training. And all for a measly 11 shillings a week, two thirds of what a man of the same rank would have got. But Eileen was special. She was a high value recruit because she had something the army needed. She could drive a truck. So-called tilly trucks 
were used as anything from ambulances to carriers of vital military equipment. And I'm having a go on one. The clutch and the accelerator and the braking is great, but the steering... Oh, oh it leaves a lot to be desired compared with today's cars. Every time I go around the corner, I, I feel it in my biceps. But these were brilliant vehicles. They were so adaptable, real dog's bodies vehicles. But the downside was that they were very bumpy and uncomfortable. I'm having a great time, but I'm only doing it for one morning. Eileen had to do it month after month. Poor old Eileen. She must have been knackered. In fact, she called it her wretched Tilly. That was a really good drive. It was nice and simple, you know, there's only sort of four or five little things to push and pull on it. But the Viz is not very good at all. It must have been very difficult at night. Absolutely, and especially because of the blackouts, headlights would have been just a glimmer of light coming from that. And obviously the threat of invasion was at its height, so uh, all of the signposts were being taken down. And so they'd have to rely on map reading and knowing where they were going. Juliet Pattinson is a historian of the ATS. She knows all about everyday life for women like Eileen. Well, they're in barracks, so they're going to be having mass catering, hearty, nutritious meals that could be feeding hundreds of people. They actually got better rations than the ordinary civilian. Um, but uh, So I think she would have been well fed. And the rest of the time when she wasn't working? She worked long hours, but she would always have time off uh, and they would uh, go to the cinema, there would always be dances on a Saturday. Women were very much in demand at local army barracks. So I think they played hard and worked hard. There's lots of nice accounts where women talk about wearing a bit of lipstick, wearing non-regulation underwear, because nobody's going to notice that they're not wearing their khaki uh, pants. Um, so there are opportunities for these women to individualise the muddy, green, grey, dull uniform. There was a slogan that beauty is a duty too. So you have these manufacturers, whether it's of toothpaste or breakfast cereal or shampoo, and it would be very much, you know, the woman in the ATS, like Eileen, who would be applying a particular kind of face cream, for example. There was this expectation that women would pay attention to their appearance because actually it would have a knock-on effect on male morale. I bet if I said to you, beauty is a duty too now, you'd <laughs> smack me in the nose. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Eileen might not have enjoyed driving her Tilly very much, but she was obviously pretty good at it because soon she was made a driving instructor and was promoted to the rank of Lance Corporal. This meant she now had 25 trainees under her and a lot more responsibility. Under Eileen, hundreds of women learned to drive and maintain motorbikes, ambulances and trucks, helping the war effort to smash the Nazis. But she was about to experience something even more exciting. One day, Eileen was ordered to go to her commandant's office and he told her a secret. Apparently, a new subaltern, which was the equivalent of a second lieutenant, was going to be working alongside her and her friends. But this was no ordinary subaltern. Her name was Princess Elizabeth. Eileen and Princess Elizabeth were soon mending the tilly trucks together. By day, subaltern Elizabeth mucked in with the other girls. But at night, she turned back into a princess and went to sleep in her castle. Eileen wrote at the time that the princess was quite striking, pretty with lovely eyes and a charming smile. But more celebrities were about to appear. One day, King George VI and his wife turn up to have a look at exactly what it is their daughter, Princess Elizabeth, is doing. And it's, a, it's all pomp and circumstance, until suddenly King George leans under the bonnet, starts fiddling away with the engine. Lord knows what he's doing. One wonders what this bit does. Elizabeth's panicking, everyone else is laughing. Then Elizabeth gets her hands out and goes, look, Dad, they're all oily. Everyone seems to have seen the funny side. Eileen later wrote that the Queen was very interested to see who these gals were consorting with her elder daughter and the king was absolutely charming. 
The visit was filmed at length and became a very effective piece of wartime propaganda. For most ordinary people at that time, the king and queen had become powerful symbols of the kind of country that they were fighting for. So when their daughter, Princess Elizabeth, was seen amongst them, mucking in, getting her hands dirty, it must have sent a really powerful message. When the Nazis finally threw in the towel, victory in Europe was celebrated with a party to end all parties. Eileen and the other women of the ATS let rip outside Buckingham Palace. And even Princess Elizabeth snuck out incognito to gatecrash the party. Four years before those joyful celebrations, it had only been that bit of muddy water we call the English Channel that held the Nazi foe at bay. But some rather unlucky Brits didn't even have that. It's easy to forget that over 60,000 British people lived under Nazi control here in the Channel Islands. From June 1940 all the way through to 1945. The German invaders were excited to have claimed a little piece of Britain. I suppose that for them, compared to fighting, say, on the Russian front, Hello sunshine, hello sky. It was almost a holiday. Hello white clouds floating by. But not so for the locals. Just keep walking. There may not have been any fighting, but the very feeling of being British and any connection with Britain was under attack. Can you imagine what life would have been like here during the German occupation? Would have been a lot of happy smiling faces, I can tell you that. One ordinary Briton, Hubert Lanyon, was the only baker on the small island of Sark, just off Guernsey. He lived there with his wife and four kids, including five-year-old Maisie. Well, I just remembered um, being told, oh, the Germans are coming, the Germans are coming, and then when they arrived, uh, they marched. And they used to sing beautiful songs, and it, it just echoed all around the island. It was, it was really lovely to hear them singing. And of course, we were a bit apprehensive, but once we got to know them, and the ordinary soldier was quite friendly. But for Hubert, the new regime changed everything overnight. He even had to share his baker's oven with the Germans. They had half the week and he had half the week. And as war went on, it, it, the provisions came from France. The flour was a terrible quality. It was full of bits of wood stones and rat droppings. To make things worse, the departing British army had taken a lot of the Channel Islands food supplies with it, and there wasn't much left. We could manage to grow vegetables, which was, a, you know, a saving grace. We didn't have meat, we didn't have much meat, just rabbit. But uh, whatever animal was killed had to be shared with the Germans. The Germans had their proportion and there was so much left for the islanders. Yeah. So the local people started to think outside the box and go in search of new culinary experiences. Yummy! The beach was awash with seaweed, which they harvested and boiled up to make jelly. It wasn't too bad if it was flavoured with blackberries or, frankly, anything they could lay their hands on. As time went by, the food shortages got worse and worse. The fishermen were only allowed to go about a mile out to sea because the Germans were frightened that they would run away. Basic commodities like soap began to disappear off the shelves. What little there was was reserved for newborn babies. Moss replaced cotton wool in the hospitals. Some people said they couldn't recognise their friends and colleagues in the street because they'd grown so thin. Even the Germans were hungry. When it came towards the end of the war, they, they shot cats, they ate cats. The Germans? Yes, uh, we saw them go up the, the lane with our cats strung on their belt. You're kidding? Our cat was on his belt, they, they'd shot it. That must have be, been awful for a it, little girl to terrible, see that. Terrible. Maisie's father, Hubert, decided to make a stand. In June 1942, the Germans had confiscated the radios on the island. And now people couldn't even get the news. 
So Hubert joined a secret organisation defiantly named Guns. The Guernsey Underground News Service. Because it was also secret, no one knew very much about it. But this building is now the Prio Library, and it's here that I reckon I'm going to find the evidence I need about what Maisie's dad was doing in the war. Historian Jilly Carr has found some of the news sheets that the resistance group published. Oh, look, that's V for Victory. Guns and V for Victory. These are original copies. Yeah. And as you can see, they're, they're typed out on tomato packing paper, which is really thin. And if you were caught with one of these, you would have been arrested. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. So what was it that Maisie's dad actually did on this newspaper? He was the distributor of guns in yeah. Sarg. He had a little library at the back of the bakery. And so he would take a newsletter and put it inside a book in the library so people would come along and browse in the library and, you yeah, know. No, no, no. But apparently there were even German soldiers who knew about it but stayed silent because they also wanted to have the real news. But not everyone could be trusted to keep a secret. Some islanders were prepared to trade information for food even at the risk of having their houses daubed with the swastika. One day, acting on a tip-off, the Germans came to the Lanyon's house, searching for Hubert and his newsletters. They had fixed bayonets and they went through the toy basket under the bed, wicker toy basket, and it went right through my panda bear's stomach. Oh. <laughs> Outrageous! <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't long before they found her dad. They beat him up and knocked teeth out, and, and he, was, he was unconscious for a while. And then they hauled him off, hands behind his back and holding his hair and pulling. And he went past our door with yeah. all the family standing on the doorstep, and he just looked at us, and I thought, I suppose he thought, well, when will I ever see them again? Can you remember what you were thinking? Well, I just thought they were being cruel to my daddy. Was your mum able to explain to you what was going on? She didn't know where he was for a month. We, we thought he'd been taken to concentration camp and perhaps shot. Then the family discovered Hubert was alive and in prison on the island. Maisie's mum pleaded for his release, saying that the islanders were desperate for him to bake bread. After four months in prison, he was released. But five others involved in the free paper were deported to Germany, where two of them died in prison. I consider my father was lucky to come home to us. Sure. And, and I do still feel very sorry for the people whose lives were lost. Of course, there's no doubt that Hubert was a very brave man, but it does make me wonder what I would have done in a similar situation. Would I have resisted, knowing that it could put my family and my neighbours in jeopardy, or would I just have gone about my business and kept my head down till the end of the war? I really don't know. In the Second World War, victory against the Nazis depended on an event that happened far away on the other side of the world, on the peaceful Pacific islands of Hawaii. In December 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and forced the United States into the war. The cavalry had arrived, and very quickly, our little island was swarming with Americans. One and a half million of them were either stationed here or stopped off here on their way to Germany. This development had a decisive impact on the course of the war and meant a heck of a lot to the Brits who worked with them, fought with them, or, as was often the case, fell in love with the American GIs. Joy Beaver would be one of them. But back in 1941, before the GIs arrived, she was just 16, and a love affair was the last thing on her mind. Joy soon became her family's only wage earner and had to support her mother and two younger brothers. 
She catched the train before half seven each day when it was cheaper. But instead of leaves or snow on the line, there was the threat of blown up bridges or unexploded shells. She had a boring job at the inland revenue in the city, typing letters to people who hadn't paid their tax. Joy lived for her daily break. Best time of day was the lunch hour, and I could walk in the gardens of the Tower of London. At the end of each day, she'd catch the train home before night fell and the bombing started once again. Supper could be an omelette made from powdered egg, or if there was nothing else available, there was the sinister threat of whale meat. In the evenings, they'd listen to jazz or popular songs on the record player. Or tune into Winston Churchill for a bit of courage. We will meet out to the Germans more than the measure. They have meted out to us. At weekends, Joy and her friends glammed up and hit the dance hall, the Embassy Ballroom in Bexley, newly reopened after the worst of the Blitz. It's really a nice place. It was a big dance hall and uh, had a nice band. And... It was also a popular haunt for American GIs. And of course, that drew a lot of girls that wanted to come there and dance with the soldiers. But these American boys were supposed to be on their best behaviour. Just look at this. This is the little book they all had to read. Instructions for American servicemen in Britain, 1942, issued by the US War Department. The purpose of this guide is to start getting you acquainted with the British, their country and their ways. It goes on to give lots of handy advice. The British are often more reserved in conduct than we. So, if Britons sit in trains or buses without striking up conversation with you, it doesn't mean they're being haughty and unfriendly. Probably they're paying more attention to you than you think. But they don't speak to you because they don't want to appear intrusive or rude. And there's another one here. I really like this. Keep out of arguments. You can rub a Britisher the wrong way by telling him, we came over and won the last one. <laughs> I don't think they'd like that. And most importantly, don't be a show-off. The British Tommy is apt to be specially touchy about the difference between his wages and yours. Keep this in mind. Actually, the British Tommy was most likely to be worried about the thought of a GI running off with his wife or the girl next door. And to be quite honest, he was probably right to be. As one British comedian famously put it, the Yanks were oversexed, overpaid and over here. But the GI that Joy met in September 1944 wasn't like that at all. How did you first meet Carl? He was brought to the embassy ballroom by the other guys in the unit. They said, well, you, you should come and meet this girl. His name was Carl Beebe. He was not so laughing and joking and all that kind of thing like the others were. You know, he didn't tell me that the streets of New York were paved with gold. <laughs> Carl was stationed here at the stately home hall place, two miles from Joy's house. He worked for US Army intelligence, intercepting encoded messages from Nazi high command. Soon, Carl asked Joy out, and they hit it off. They'd go for walks in the park near where she lived. He was always bringing me flowers or something. For Easter, he picked a whole bunch of daffodils. There's a place where flowers grow. After three months of courting, Carl proposed. But arranging a wedding in wartime required, let's say, special skills. How did you get a dress this nice in the middle of the war? You'd have to ask my brother. 
how he got it through some friends of his or people he knows, I don't know. So you're saying it was off the black market, really, aren't you? I believe that it was the black market, yes. Did you get married in a church? Yes, I did. A very much damaged church. The roof was out and uh, the rain and the snow was coming through. And they'd had little pots on the floor to catch the water and you could hear the water dinging into the pots. The Second World War had brought Joy and Carl together and they eventually made the journey to America together with their young son. The war created huge rifts between countries, which took decades to heal. So it's nice to hear some stories of romance coming out of all that chaos. For Joy, at least, and for others like her, the war did have a silver lining. The Second World War was the people's war. And for many Britons, its triumphant end remains one of our country's finest hours. 